This is a recording of the talk that I gave at PhysicsCon 2024, hosted by the Southern California chapter of the American Association of Physics Teachers. And the topic is falling through the earth. So the question that this is addressing, of course, if you had a tunnel going from one side of the earth through the center to the other, and you jumped in, uh, how long would it take to fall through to the other side? Now, this is an old question. Uh, going back to ancient Greece, Hesiod said that uh, the time it would take an anvil to fall from Earth's surface to the uh, pits of Tartarus would take nine days. And then if we zoom forward a couple of thousand years, we have the remake of Total Recall featuring one of these gravity tunnels. And lots of chatter in between. We had Galileo, uh, Isaac Newton, and Thomas Hook talking about cannonballs instead of anvils falling to the Earth. Uh, then over the centuries, we had popular science articles and homework problems, and the physics obsession of this, or with this, kind of goes back to this 1966 paper in the American Journal of Physics. So before we figure this out, we want to know where we would actually go. If we went straight down from Long Beach, California, we'd come out in the ocean off the coast of Madagascar. Uh, because the Earth is mostly water, things across from land are most likely to be water. Uh, this map shows a projection where when land is across from land, it's colored dark orange. You can see uh, there's not a lot available, mostly between South America and Southeast Asia and China. Uh, there's a few routes such as uh, Santiago to Xi'an or Hawaii to Botswana or Spain to New Zealand that might be appealing. These take uh, over two days on commercial airlines and cost thousands of dollars. So maybe there's a, you know, a commercial need for one of these tunnels. Uh, now, let's discuss some preliminaries. Uh, what happens when you jump in a tunnel like this? So uh, gravity pulls you towards the center. You get faster and faster and faster, and you reach your maximum speed uh, as you pass the center of the Earth. Now, there's a misconception that because there's no gravity right at Earth's center, you would just uh, hover there, but you have to remember Newton's first law. You are going very fast at this point. You are in motion and you remain in motion and you start to decelerate as gravity pulls you back towards the center of the Earth. And uh, by symmetry, you reach zero velocity at the other side and you have to grab on or else you would just bob back and forth. So the important thing is uh, the symmetry of the problem tells us that the time we spend accelerating is the same as the time we spend decelerating. So because we can't actually dig a tunnel like this and drop something in and do the experiment, we have to make assumptions when we solve this problem. So talk about a few of them. Uh, we ignore friction and drag. We start by ignoring the rotation of the Earth, uh, or we can say we're falling from pole to pole. We're assuming the Earth is a sphere. Um, we're assuming this tunnel actually exists. And uh, we're not falling close to the speed of light. But the first uh, main assumption I want to talk about is what I call the high school version of this problem. So we assume that the gravitational field strength of Earth, uh, little g, is a constant at 9.8 meters per second squared. So that lets us uh, write down the kinematic equation we learned that relates uh, the distance traveled to the time we spend accelerating. And here, the distance we want to go is the radius of the Earth, so, so about 4,000 miles. The acceleration is just little g. And this will give us the time if we solve for t that it takes to reach the center. And we double that to find the time it takes to reach the other side. So you know, we solve for p. We get this expression that we can put numbers into. And if we do that, we get 38 minutes. So about 60, 60 times faster than you know, commercial airliners can currently do. Pretty impressive. But we also know that the gravitational field strength or acceleration is not constant inside the Earth. Uh, so we might need some more advanced physics to understand this problem. So make another assumption, what I call the college version of the problem. And instead of su assuming that the gravity is constant, we'll assume that the density is constant. So let this lets us tie into Newton's law of gravity, which says that the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to their mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them. If uh, one of the objects is a sphere, uh, or spherically symmetric, we can assume that all the mass is located at the center of the sphere and it would have the same gravitational field beyond its radius. If we are within a uniform sphere, 
then uh, we have the shell theorem, which says that if we kind of draw uh, a radius around our position centered on the center of the object, the gravitational field we experience is only due to the mass below us or at a smaller radius, and the mass above us or outside the sphere that we're above uh, cancels out. So if the density is uniform, then mass is just proportional to volume. Uh, volume is proportional to the cube of radius, which means the mass that gravitates is proportional to the cube of our uh, rate radial position. So to figure out how long this would actually take to fall through, we can equate Newton's second law, F equals ma, with Newton's law of gravity, where the mass depends on uh, a radial position. So if we use the shell theorem, we know that the mass grows as the cube of radius, the gravitational field falls off as the square of radius, and these cubed and square cancel, leaving us with a linear term in gravity. We can also rewrite this in terms of the gravitational acceleration, which linearly interpolates between zero and its surface value. And I will just use this so I don't have to write as many symbols. So putting this together, uh, you know, F equals MA equals E M M over squared. We cancel the mass of the falling thing. We put everything on one side of the equation and we are left with this differential equation, which every physicist knows is the equation for simple harmonic motion, uh, a mass on a spring. So if there's one thing that was drilled into me in college, it's that when we have this differential equation, the square root of the linear coefficient is the angular frequency of oscillation. So if we start at the surface with zero velocity, we have cosine oscillations with an angular frequency of the square root of d over r. We know uh, that the period of oscillation is two pi over that, but the period is the time it takes to go from here to there to here. We just wanna go from here to there. So half the period is pi over omega, pi root r over d. And if we put numbers into this, we get uh, 42 minutes. So 11% slower uh, than the high school version using some more advanced physics. Now, these tubes don't just have to go straight down to the other side. If you take any two points and connect them with a straight tunnel, you can show that the force along this tunnel is proportional to the position uh, from the center, which again gives simple harmonic motion with uh, the same angular frequency or a half period of 42 minutes. It means you can connect any two points, whether it's you know, Los Angeles to Australia or Los Angeles to New York, and it would take the same 42 minutes to fall through. And I think that's one of the weirdest results in classical mechanics. Uh, you might also know that the period of low Earth orbit is 84 minutes. Half of that is 42 minutes. Uh, these are the same, and you can figure that why that's the case with some pencil and paper if you want. So we also know that the density of Earth is not uniform. Um, we know that the Earth is a ravioli. It has a core and a mantle. Uh, and the way we know this is by measuring earthquakes. Uh, the time it takes for earthquakes to get from their epicenter to different points depends on how they go through the different layers. Uh, the density changes the speed of propagation. There's reflection and refraction from the different boundary layers. And geologists have constructed what's called the preliminary reference Earth model. Uh, which describes the density as a function of depth, showing the density profile on this plot here in the red. We see at the center of the Earth, uh, it's about 12 times as dense as water. It starts to uh, decrease, and at the core mantle boundary, it drops down by a lot, decreases again, and then towards the crust, which is approximately the density of water, at least at the very surface. So if we integrate that, um, we get the gravitational acceleration, which I have here in the black dashes, so at the surface, it's 9.8. And as we go deeper, we are actually getting closer to a higher density sphere, which means that the gravitational field strength increases as we go deeper, uh, which is a little counterintuitive, reaching a maximum of about 10.6 and then falling off uh, towards the center. So this is based on earthquake data. You can also use satellites to measure the gravitational field at different latitudes, which tells us um, similar information. And most recently, there is a neutrino detector on the South Pole called Ice Cube. And by measuring neutrinos passing through the Earth at different angles, it can reconstruct. Um, it's not an X-ray because it's neutrinos, but essentially an X-ray of Earth's interior, finding data consistent with the PREN model, just with uh, bigger error bars. 
So we can't just write down an equation that tells us how long it takes to fall through this uh, prime gravity profile. So we have to use numerical methods. Um, one of the simplest is Euler's method, which essentially uh, expands out the derivative. So I know that my position in the future is my position now plus my velocity times the time difference towards the future. My velocity in the future is my velocity now plus my acceleration times the time difference towards the future. So if I know acceleration based on looking it up in a table of prem values, I can figure out how velocity changes and I can figure out how position changes. So we can set up an algorithm where we start at the surface, uh, increment our velocity by the acceleration, increment our position by the velocity, find what the new acceleration is, and then repeat until our radius equals zero, figure out how long it takes. So if we do the calculation, uh, I'll just remind you of our different results. The high school version with constant gravity took 38 minutes. The more complex college version with constant density took 42 minutes. And if we use this realistic uh, density profile, the answer we get is 38 minutes and 11 seconds. Now it turns out that the high school version was closer to being correct. Um, we can also look at the sideways tunnels and it's no longer 42 minutes to any point on the Earth. You can't really do this with a pencil and paper. It's a bit more complicated, but you can show that it interpolates from 42 minutes for short trips to 38 minutes uh, for long trips. And again, the constant uh, gravity model approximates the prem solution really well. So the question then arises, why does this work so well? And the best reason I can give is that uh, by definition, we spend most of the time in regions where the velocity is slow. Uh, velocity is slow when we're near the start and end of the tunnel, and we haven't been accelerating for that long. And in that region, gravity is approximately constant. Uh, by the time we get to the region of the Earth where the gravity varies a lot, we're going so fast that we spend comparatively little time there. And that's why this approximation that G is constant works uh, pretty well. Now, this is specifically a feature of Earth. If you try this with the density profile of other planets, if you were able to get that information, it would not necessarily be the same. So I wrote this up in a paper in the American Journal of Physics in 2015, and it uh, propagated uh, around the world. I was famous for about two weeks. It was on the Canadian Discovery Channel. I was interviewed on NPR, although they didn't um, run the interview. And this got a lot of people uh, to appreciate that physics can be used to um, learn new things about, you know, not exactly an everyday experience, but something that we can that normal people can think about. Uh, it also got a lot of scientists out there to think about these various falling through the earth problems. So if we go back to our list of assumptions, oh yeah, sorry, so before that, uh, just mention that at this conference, I told the organizer that I would talk about the latest research into gravity tunnels. Um, and then the abstract said I would talk about the latest research into gravity tunnels, which are actually a thing, but it's the latest research, which is a thing, not the gravity tunnels. So um, going back to that, for a list of assumptions, if we assume that if we want to do away with the assumption that there's no friction, we can look at uh, Concanon and Giordano, who talked about that. If we want to consider rotation, uh, that makes things a lot more complicated. You're no longer guaranteed to reach the other side. Uh, you might get stuck in the middle. You might get flung out into space. Uh, but you can read this paper by Simonich, and there are some others out there as well. Uh, the Earth is not a perfect sphere, it's an oblate spheroid, and uh, Kylette has written a paper about that. Again, you might get stuck in the middle, depending on the oblateness of the spheroid. And if you happen to be falling through a neutron star, uh, then you can read this paper by Max Seal, uh, which derives a general relativistic uh, expression for the time it takes to fall through a gravitating object. So we put all this together, and there's only one... Uh, assumption left, which is that engineering is easy and not a problem, and all we have left to do is dig. Thank you.